Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you to Miles and our musicians for leading the first part of our service. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 23 that Miles read to us earlier, I won't preach for several hours. Well, I don't plan to preach for several hours, and I won't do justice to this passage. I really gave up trying to work out how I could get all of this adequately into one message. So it's all going to be very superficial, really. But I hope it is helpful and I hope it's a little bit encouraging. Indeed, I hope it lifts your our hearts and minds above the pressures of this day and the problems that are facing you at work tomorrow morning and the headache that you've got at home and that actually you see that over and above all that is here in our lives stands Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who not only has dealt with the past and is not only uh, sorting out the future, but he's here with us in the present. So this is what we're going to look at in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 23. So let me pray and then we'll get right into these verses. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Bible is true. We live in days where people actually think that there's nothing that's true and we should just do what the masses want. But that is hopeless and leads to meaninglessness and despair. We need to know something from the outside, something that is reliable, something that we can build our lives upon, something that is just something that is righteous, something that is true. But more than that, we need something that is powerful enough to deal with our lives, deal with our mistakes, and deal with our futures. Indeed, that is stronger than death itself. And we thank you that we have Jesus Christ who died and rose again. And we have this tremendous passage about him. And we pray that as we study it tonight, our hearts might understand and that we might believe and that uh, as we trust in Jesus Christ a spiritual life would be born in us and we would go out from this place as we're walking on air because we know we're right with God forever and ever. Amen. Do you remember when your parents took you out in the car for the first or second time as you were learning to drive? Do you remember how, when you were meant to be stopping, your parents said, um, just apply the brake a little bit now, please. Do you remember? And when you were just about to hit that lamppost, your, your dad said, just a little bit more to the right, please. Do you remember that? And when the police were flashing you behind, they said, um, just stop now, please. It was so gentle and kind, wasn't it? Do you remember? I mean, you, you didn't have to be ordered out of the car, did you? <laughs> your, your parents weren't there screaming and pulling their hair out and trying to hit you. You know, the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossians, and there's big problems there. And yet, you know, he's so kind so gentle in the way he writes them. He, he's not like, you know, your parents. He's like the sat-nav, you know? You, you, you're turning down the wrong way down a one-way street and your parents scream at you. Your sat-nav says, please turn around at the first available opportunity. <laughs> and, I, and that's what the Apostle Paul does. It's wonderful here in Colossians. He deals with us so gently, but so we should because we follow Jesus Christ who deals with us gently. We should always be dealing gently with people. So if you ever have cause to speak to someone, make sure you speak to them gently because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And if the king upon the throne is gentle, how much more should we? And here in Colossians chapter 3, the passage that begins really at verse 13 goes all the way to chapter 2 verse 5. But we can't look at all of it this evening. We're going to only going to look at the first half this evening, which I've called trust. The second half that we'll look at, God willing, next time is obey. So you've got trust and obey. I've actually called this sermon just for tonight, worship. Uh, uh, and, uh, but it's really about trusting Jesus and then obeying Jesus. And I was thinking today about how lovely this February weather is. 
And I remember about 15 years ago, a friend of mine got married on February the 14th, Valentine's Day, just so that he could remember it. And it was the most glorious February day. We were out there in, you know, shirt sleeves because it was such a warm day, wonderful for their wedding. And I, I, I listened as they got married because his wife promised to obey. And then they sang the hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way. And I thought, yes, he's saying, I'll trust, you obey. And I thought, well, isn't that what marriage is all about? But here the Apostle Paul is talking about us trusting Jesus Christ, and next time it's us obeying Jesus Christ. And this is really what faith is. Faith is that which follows Jesus Christ, because we trust him, we will obey him. It's impossible to have faith that trusts and doesn't obey. Faith is trusts and obeys. And here in our verses 13 and 14, we, we are to trust because of what God has done. I put down what Jesus has done, but it really should be what God has done for us. For he, for God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom, in Jesus, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. The tragedy is that there are so many people in Bournemouth tonight who have no idea that they are in the dominion of darkness. They think they're just doing what they want to do. They think they're just living life as they like it. They do not understand that the powers of evil are actually directing and dominating and ultimately damning and destroying their lives. We see people who are, are leaving their third relationship, kids just being tossed aside, wives just being tossed aside. They're just doing what they want to do. They're causing mayhem, causing pain, causing destruction, and they just think they're doing what they want to do. They have no idea that they are actually under the control, the dominion of darkness. But God does something. And to the Christians, Paul says that God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In 1970, my dad was a medical doctor, a GP down in Somerset. And about midnight, one o'clock in the morning, he had a phone call from one of his patients who had just moved 45 miles away to Froome. And the patient was really ill. But he couldn't get a local doctor because he had moved away and hadn't changed his doctor. And he rang my dad up and said, look, can you come and help me? So my dad set off in the uh, foggy, icy, dark winter's night. He was driving as fast as he could to get to Froome, where going round a corner in the fog on the ice, he skidded, and the car rolled down a large embankment. The car was smashed up. He was smashed up. He, 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 he broke vertebrae in his back. He broke his shoulder. He, he, he damaged uh, so much of his body. But he was thrown. He didn't wear a seatbelt. And he was thrown into the back uh, corner of the car, which was the only part of the car that wasn't smashed up completely. So he lived. He had a torch in his dashboard, a rubber torch, so it, uh, it hadn't been smashed up. So he managed in great pain to uh, get the torch out of the uh, dashboard and he scrambled up to the road. No cars were coming along. About half an hour later, a car started coming along. So he decided to flag the car down with his torch. Well, the car didn't seem to be uh, slowing down, so he then turned the torch onto his face so that the uh, driver would see that there was blood and that he'd been involved in an accident. So as soon as he put the torch on his face, the car sped up and shot by. About 10 minutes later, a car coming back in the other direction. And so this time my dad flagged the car down and didn't put the torch on his face, and the car stopped. Actually, it was the same guy who had gone past and then felt guilty and turned around and came back. And this guy, 
He was actually chef of the Indian restaurant, so he came and visited us and cooked curries for us. Wonderful. You know, if you ever have an accident, do it where there's a chef of an Indian restaurant nearby to come and rescue you. But this guy, he rescued my dad. He helped my dad in the car. He drove him the 40 miles. Well, he was going to take him to hospital, but my dad explained that he was a doctor. Bring him home. And he drove my dad all the way home. He rescued my dad. Well, Jesus Christ, God, has rescued us. We were in a dreadful situation. We were not only making a mess of our lives, but we are separated from God. So we're not only hurtling towards um, making utter disaster of our, our lifestyles, but we're heading to eternal separation from God, what the Bible calls hell. But God has rescued us. Look at what it says there. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. My dad, when he was uh, injured and he was rescued, the, the guy who rescued him brought my dad back, not to the hospital, but to my dad's own house. But when God rescues us, God doesn't just sort out our lives and put us back to square one and say, now start again. No, when God rescues us, he not only rescues us from the mess we were making of our lives, but he brings us into his kingdom, into the kingdom of the son he loves. We're brought into God's kingdom. So those of you who are Christians this evening, you now are members of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which has completely different rules. You know, we were born in the, the United Kingdom, in this kingdom, where people live for themselves. It's dog eat dog. You, you push yourself forward. But now we're in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ reigns. We follow Jesus Christ. We serve Jesus Christ. We live for Jesus Christ. We've been brought into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom... We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption isn't a common word today. It means to be bought with a price. If you ever read the very moving story, Uncle Tom's Cabin, you find that at the very end of the story, Uncle Tom, the slave, has had to be sold. And he, he's the victim of a very cruel, brutal uh, slave owner. And so George saves up all his money. He gets all the money he can so that he can go and buy Tom back. But when he goes and finds Tom, Tom's dying. Dying of the treatment he's received. In a shed, dying. And George kneels down beside Tom and says, Tom, Tom, don't die. Don't leave me. I've redeemed you. He's brought the money to pay for his liberty. And Uncle Tom says to him, he says, you're too late, but Jesus Christ has already redeemed me, and I'm going home to heaven. Jesus Christ has paid the price for you to be saved. Jesus Christ has redeemed you. So if Jesus Christ has paid the price for you to be saved, how much do you have to pay? How much church attendance do you have to give? How much good works do you have to do? How much money do you have to put in the offering? How much do you have to give to charity? How much do you have, do you have to do for others? And the answer is he's done it all. It's a free gift of God. We have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, and it's all been done for us. And it's given to us as a free gift. That's what God has done for us. He has rescued us. He's brought us into the kingdom of Christ. We've been set free. We've been purchased. We've been forgiven by Jesus Christ. Well, the Apostle Paul says that, and then he immediately moves on to sing a hymn. I remember listening to a preacher once, and he was preaching like I'm doing, probably a bit better, probably a lot better, but suddenly he started singing. It woke us all up. Well, I promise not to burst into song, all right, because it wouldn't be a pleasant experience for you. But the Apostle Paul bursts into song in verses 15 to 20. And he has this hymn here about who Jesus is. It's really got two verses. The first verse says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
And then the second verse begins at verse 18. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and firstborn from among the dead. The first verse is about the firstborn over all creation. The second verse is about the uh, firstborn from the dead. The firstborn of the new creation. Now, if you read Greek, you could go back to this as the Apostle Paul wrote it and realize that it's actually in poetry. And you can put the Greek to a hymn tune. And those of you who are, who are older will know the hymn, Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus our Blessed Redeemer. And you could actually sing this in Greek to that tune. It was a hymn that the Apostle Paul knew. It probably wasn't written by the Apostle Paul. We can't be certain about that. But if you read these verses, you will see that it never mentions the name Jesus, never the name Christ, never the term Lord. The, these terms, these words that the Apostle Paul almost found impossible not to use, none of them appear in this uh, poem. And so it's probably not written by the Apostle Paul, but the Apostle Paul would have loved it so much that he, he said that fits in well. Let's put it here. We're telling them about, about what, has God, what God has done for us in Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? Now, if you were to go outside the doors of this church and ask people as they walk up and down the road, who is Jesus? People will probably say he is or was a carpenter from Nazareth. And would they be correct? Yes, they would be absolutely correct. Jesus was a carpenter in Nazareth. But is that all Jesus was? Was he more than just a carpenter in Nazareth? That's the question. And some people will say, no, that's just myth. That's just legend. He was no more than the carpenter of Nazareth. Others will say, no, he was much more. He went over and spent years studying magic arts and was a guru. And that's why he could do these, the, the, these, uh, use these magic uh, skills. But the Apostle Paul doesn't think that Jesus was a legend. And he doesn't think that Jesus was a guru. He tells us that Jesus Christ is nothing less than God become man, the second person of the Trinity in human flesh. Look, look at what he says. Let's look at the, uh, the first half of this song. First of all, Jesus is Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, when they, when they used the word Jehovah or Yahweh, that was so, such a tremendous word, it was the name of God, that they wouldn't write uh, it completely. They would just put certain letters and put different vowels in. It was a sacred word. So when they wrote the New Testament, and they wanted to tr translate this name of Jehovah, this name of Yahweh, the, the personal name of God, as it were, they used the word Lord. And Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the man who is God. Indeed, we're told he is the image of the invisible God. Images. We don't tend to have images. Statues. Yes, sometimes in uh, town centers you can see statues of famous people. Well, in the days that the Apostle Paul wrote, when the Roman Empire conquered a city... He would put up an image of himself in that city. So as people walked by the image, they would realize, ah, we know who the king is. <laughs> yeah, and we know what he is like. There's his image. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus Christ is the exact representation, the perfect image of God. He shows us who God is. He shows us what God is like. Sometimes if they're going to build a new uh, shopping complex or something, the, the, the architects will make a model. And you can go and see the model, and it's to scale. It's exactly what the shopping center is going to be like. But what is God like? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You can't see him, but if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Jesus makes the invisible God visible to us. He makes the unseen God known to us. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. 
And then he is the firstborn over all creation. He is the heir. He is the son of God. Some time ago, I was asked to take some meetings somewhere, and I was asked to speak on this passage. And I was just preparing this uh, talk on the, uh, Jesus being the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, when there was a ring at the door. And it was a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I went to see them, and I said, it's so nice to see you. They didn't quite expect such a warm welcome. I, I said, I, I've just been reading... Uh, Colossians about who Jesus Christ is. That he's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. What do you think that means? Well, they said, oh, it means that God I I existed and Jesus Christ didn't exist. And then God created Jesus. And Jesus is God's firstborn son. It's as if as if. Uh, God is there and Jesus is a creature. And Jesus is a creature created by God and he's just God's firstborn son. I said that's interesting, but it doesn't say that Jesus is the firstborn of God. It literally says he's the firstborn of creation. So it's not actually God who gave birth to Jesus, but it's creation who gave birth to Jesus. Oh, hadn't seen that, they said. And I said, if you look at your version, when you get to chapters, verses 16 and 17, you have to say that for by him all other things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all other things were created by him and for him. Indeed, in their translation of the Bible, they have to add the word other, Four times, because they say, well, Jesus is created, and then he created all other things. But, but Paul is not telling us that Jesus was created. He's not telling us that Jesus was actually, you know, like giving birth to a son. There was a time when he didn't exist, and then he was born, and he was created. It's saying that Jesus Christ is the heir, the firstborn was the person who inherited everything. So if you were born in a family and you were the firstborn son, then you had it made for you because you inherited everything. You got twice as much as all the others. You were the one who owned everything. And Jesus Christ is the owner. He is the heir. Everything belongs to him. The whole of creation belongs to him. He is the firstborn over all creation. Not only does he own it, but he created it. Not only is he the image of God, not only is he the son of God, who, who, not only does he show us what God is like, not only does he own all that God has, but he is actually the creator of all things. But didn't God the Father create everything? Wasn't it in the beginning God said, let there be light? Yes. But listen to John's gospel. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. All things were created by him. There is nothing that has been created that was not created by him. Jesus Christ is the creator. It was Jesus Christ who said, let there be light. It was Jesus Christ who let, said, let there be a break between the waters above and the waters below. Jesus is the creator. That man they nailed to the cross, that baby they put in the uh, manger is the, the human body indwelt by the second person of the Trinity who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He was the one who threw the stars into space. He was the one who caused time to start. He is the creator. And not only is he the image of God who shows us what God is like, not only is he the heir who owns everything, not only is he the creator of everything, but he's the controller of everything as well. In him, all things hold together. We're not running out of control. We're under his control. It's like uh, when you're driving a minibus and you've got lots of kids in the back. Some of them are fighting, some of them are playing games, some of them are sleeping. They're all doing different things. But the driver controls where they go. Well, we live in a world where there's so much sin and so much evil. 
But Jesus Christ is in control where we're going. That one day, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Who is Jesus? He's the Lord. He's the image, the heir, the creator, and the controller of all things. But let's look at the second verse of this hymn. Jesus, the Lord, is also the Savior. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. There are some people who want to have Jesus just as Savior, but the one who is the Savior is the Lord. He's Lord and Savior. He's the firstborn of the new creation. He's the head of the church, which is his body. So when it says there, he's the head, he is the head of the body. It's again saying he's the ruler. He's the one who's in control. Not only is he the ruler, but again we have this phrase about the, the firstborn. He is the beginning of the resurrection. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So not only is he in control of things now, but he's in control of things for all eternity. After death, he's in control of life and death. Indeed, not only is he the head of the church, not only will he raise people from the dead, but he is supreme. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. Back about, I don't know, must be 180 years ago, William Burns was a fiery young evangelist in Scotland, and he went out to China to be a missionary. And as he went around preaching from area to area, there, there were, he, he got arrested and he got dragged before the emperor. And they brought him in before the emperor and they threw him on his knees. And he knelt on one knee. And the emperor said, down on your knees, dog. And he stayed on one knee. And they said, when you are before the emperor, you kneel on both knees. He said, no. He says, I only kneel on both knees before Jesus, who is the king of kings and the emperor of emperors. Only Jesus Christ is supreme. So they let him kneel just on one knee before the emperor. Jesus Christ is supreme. Indeed, we're told next that all God's fullness dwells in him. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. It's not simply that Jesus is 100% God, Jesus is 100% God, but the truth is that 100% of God dwells in Jesus. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. This is the mysteries of the Trinity. But Jesus is 100% God and all the fullness of the Godhead lives in Jesus Christ. This is his person. He is the man who is God. He's not a bit divine. He's not half God. He is Fully God, all the fullness of God dwells in him. And that's his person, his work, is that he has reconciled all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. And through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You remember Genesis? God created the heavens and the earth. And there was complete peace between the heavens and the earth. And then sin came in. And sin caused a separation. Sin caused the curse. Sin caused the judgment. Sin caused death. Well, Jesus Christ has come to undo it all. And by Jesus Christ's death, by being the man who, who was hanged upon the tree, he made peace by shedding his blood. So for all eternity, Jesus Christ will have undone everything went, that went wrong. And now there is complete reconciliation, whether things in heaven or on earth. All things are reconciled to God through making peace through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. Sin is banished. Sin and death and Satan and hell banished. And in the new creation, there is this peace with all things on earth or in heaven. Never think that 
The future is in heaven where ghostly little things wafting around on clouds. There's a new heaven and a new earth, not merely as real as this is, but even more so. Jesus Christ brings in the new heaven and the new earth. The question I want to ask just before I go on to my last point is, do you believe in this Jesus? If I ask you who Jesus is, say, well, the carpenter of Nazareth, or maybe a legend, or maybe a guru, or do you realize that he is the Savior and the Lord? He is the man who is God because this is what is all important. It's not simply, oh, I'm going to try Christianity or I'm going to give church a go. It's that you realize who Jesus Christ is. This is what is of supreme importance. That's who Jesus is. So finally, let's look at how Jesus Christ saves. These verses are so important and they're so simple. It begins by telling us that we were in a bad state. Once upon a time, you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. We were not only evil in our behavior, making a mess of our lives, but we were alienated from God, destroying our souls. That's the situation we were in. Paul says in Ephesians, you were dead in your sins. I was working one evening and I rang Caroline up and said, look, I'm not going to come home for my uh, supper. I'm going to keep working. And uh, she said, well, what are you going to do about eating? I said, oh, I'm going to nip over to KFC. So that was nice. So um, that evening I, I nipped out the back and I went round to KFC and I almost fell over a drunk who was uh, bedding down uh, at the post office. Now, now, he wasn't dead. He was drunk. And then I went into KFC, and while I was uh, eating my food, there was a, a blind man who came in with his guide dog, and it, it was incredible how good the guide dog was, and he took the frame off the guide dog and let the dog rest, but, but he wasn't dead, he was blind. And then I picked up my chicken, and it was dead, right? Okay, it was dead. Well, the Apostle Paul says, we're not drunk. And we're going to sober up. It's not, we're blind and we, we, we just need a, a little bit of, of guidance, a point in the right direction. We're dead. And Jesus Christ has come to make us alive. We were separated from God, alienated from God, and evil in our behavior. That's what we were, but look what happened. But we were reconciled. God reconciled you by Jesus Christ's death. God did it. You didn't make yourself good enough for God. God came down and made us acceptable to him. We were alienated from God. We were enemies of God. We were on the road to destruction. And God stepped in. God became man, born in the, uh, that little town of Bethlehem, crucified in that big city of Jerusalem, laid in the grave and then rose again, defeating sin and death and hell and he has done everything so that we can be right with God now we were alienated now we've been reconciled and God has done it by Christ's physical body that's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem through death that's why Jesus Christ died outside Jerusalem and God did it God has reconciled you so if you are a Christian tonight and someone says how did you become a Christian you say God did it I was alienated from God, and God has reconciled me by Christ's life and death. And so they say, well, don't you do anything? Oh, yes. So you see, finally, it's if you continue in your faith. We must believe in Jesus Christ. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. We believe in divine sovereignty and human responsibility. We believe that God chooses. We believe that you choose God. We believe that God keeps you and we believe that you keep on. Here it is, if you continue in your faith. Faith is not uh, giving it a try. Faith is not a nine-day wonder. Faith isn't kneeling down at the church and saying a little prayer and then getting up and forgetting about it. Faith isn't, oh, I went to Sunday school, I believed it once. 
Faith, it, it, it's, it's been gripped and conquered by the gospel. You know it's true and therefore you continue in it and you face spiritual battles and you face doubts and you face temptations and you repent of your sin when you fail and you get up and you keep going and you continue in your faith. You know what faith is? Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you started? Best illustration I know of faith is the illustration of the knife thrower. Do you know the illustration of the knife thrower? Well, it goes like this. Did you know that I'm a knife thrower? Did you know that you, know, you can stand up against the wall and I can throw knives against you? And you just stand there and I miss every time. Did you know I was a knife thrower? No, you say. Don't believe you're a knife thrower. I say, oh, well, look, look I, can, I can show you, show you my knives. Here they are, and I show you my lovely knives that I've got. And you say, you could have bought those from Lidl. You know, that doesn't prove you're a knife thrower. I say, oh, well, look, I've got certificates. Here, I've got a certificate. Here, I've got the world championship at knife throwing. You say, ah, you could have printed that out on your computer. You could have done it yourself. Now, I don't believe you're a knife thrower. I say, Okay, well, look, here are photographs of me, you know, getting the certificate. Uh, well, that's a bit more convincing. But they, you could have, um, you know, they could be fake. I said, okay, well, look, here's a video of me throwing knives at Caroline and missing every time. And so you watch the video. You say, oh, well, that's a little bit more convincing. And then Caroline comes along and you say to Caroline, Caroline, is he really a, a, a brilliant knife thrower? And she says, yeah, yeah, look, look, I've got no stab wounds in me at all. And you've seen the pictures and you've seen the certificates and you've seen the knives and you've seen the video. Yeah, he's a great knife thrower. And you say, oh, Chris, I'm really sorry I didn't believe you. But now I believe that you are a knife thrower. I believe that you are a great knife thrower. I believe that, you know, Caroline can stand there every time you throw knives at her and you miss every time. I say, do you really believe that? You say, yeah. I say, okay, well, stand against the wall and let me throw knives then. You say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm willing to believe about you. I'm not willing to believe in you. And there are lots of people who've grown up in Sunday school and they've grown up in church and they believe about Jesus. And if they say, do they believe that Jesus is the Son of God? They'll say, yes. Do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus lived a sinless life? Yes. Do you believe he died in your place? Yes. Right, well, you go and trust your life to him. No. I want to be in control of my life. Do you see the difference between believing about Jesus and believing in Jesus. See what it is to have faith. And Paul says if you continue in your faith. Then you are saved. Well you can't continue unless you start. So why not bow your head now. And pray to Jesus. And tell him that you believe. That he is Lord and Saviour. He is God become man who is the head of creation and the head of the new creation and you commit your life to him and you trust in him as your savior we'll pray now and then i'll hand over to miles let's pray heavenly father we thank you for these wonderful wonderful verses that tell us how wonderful jesus christ is we realize that every night on the television his name is blasphemed so many times that now it doesn't even count as an obscenity or a blasphemy or a swear word. We, believe, we, we know that all around this world there are people who only know the name of Jesus Christ as a swear word. We realize that the forces of darkness are so, so pervasive in this world. That actually most people reject Jesus Christ not having a clue who he is. And then here we are. And we are tempted just to have an intellectual belief about Jesus Christ. Rather than a living faith in Jesus Christ. And yet having realized that Jesus Christ is none other than the one in whom the whole fullness of the Godhead lives in bodily form. 
He is the one who died and rose again. He is the one who's in control of the past, the present, and the future. We realize it would be silly to try and live our lives independent of him. So here and now we ask for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. And we commit our lives to following King Jesus and ask that he would reign in us now and for eternity. Amen.